Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Naja Rhodes. Um, I was a software engineer at Microsoft, uh, working on web services, currently at large, I guess. And I dedicated my summer as a scholar to language, uh, specifically generative models for language. Why would that be? Um, I'm really intrigued by artistic creative applications of machine learning. Computer vision is where the coolest efforts towards this kind of thing is focused, in my opinion. Um, and it's no wonder why. Um, playing with visuals and imagery um, is innately mesmerizing and fun for humans. Uh, meanwhile, I feel like there's a conspicuous lack of text-based creative projects. Although, maybe I'm following the wrong people on Twitter, so <laughs> please do let me know if you know any about any other cool projects or cool people working in creative NLP, because I'd love to hear more. You can find me at the demo tables. Um, but my suspicion about the imbalance is that text has a fundamental challenge. It can be really hard to make sense of erratic outputs, as I learned this summer. Um, it can be literally mind-numbing mind in their incoherence and instead of interesting like at all. So I, I read a lot of ba bad samples this summer. Um, and there, it's kind of because there's different kinds of failures, right? With um, images, there's this cool project called text-to-image um, where you type a caption and then the GAN tries to generate an image that matches that caption. So you can see that you know, when it tries to uh, generate a cat sitting on a windowsill in a room, uh, you kind of get something cat-like. There's some fur, a general shape. I don't know where the head is, but you know, at least it's kind of still compelling. Like you can still look at it, even though it's technically a failure. But with text, it's like this is the kind of stuff I was looking at all summer. Unk is the unknown token, and um, yeah, unk, 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 and then a bunch of like repetitive stuff and. I like this Dr. Seuss quote, um, but unfortunately it didn't quite hold up uh, in my summer because I was reading a lot of garbled generations that were total nonsense. But, you know, every once in a while it would give me something that was, you know, somewhat coherent, um, like a deep house tune. So I was trying to talk about music, house music, it's trying to say something about house music. What exactly? I'm not completely sure, but uh, it's kind of delightful. Like, you can kind of try to get a sense of what it's trying to say. Um, and so my goal for the summer of text generation was to aim for good, descriptive, meaningful generations. Um, but if all else fails, at the very least, reach this kind of level of delightfully incoherent. Um, so generative text, but of what kinds? Uh, the final project idea that drove my NLP studies this summer is what I call Deep Hype Bot. Uh, it's my Twitter bot for auto-generating uh, good music commentary. Um, the idea was to automatically det detect tweets about songs, um, obtain interesting attributes about the songs from Spotify, um, and then use that to condition the language model and feed that into my model and produce some sort of coherent commentary about the song. Um, and this idea was largely thanks to an inspiring data source um, called the Hype Machine. Um, it's a music blog aggregator um, throughout undergrad and ever since I kind of relied on it because it has this collection of small music blogs that it gathers and then it has these charts and you can play the music, click through, look at the different blogs. Um, so early in the summer I wrote up some API calling, um, web scraping, rate limited Python code for collecting this training data, um, extracting it, cleaned up over about 100,000 sentences. Um, and so to get into the deep learning a little bit, my model employs a conditional sequence-to-sequence -sequence variational autoencoder uh, to model language. And why I liked this particular architecture is because it first learns a rich rep uh, representation, latent representation of the text, um, and then it uses that representation to generate new samples. Um, and it works at a more macro or global level um, because it encodes the entire sentence versus like an LSTM, which is taking a, histor a historical context and then trying to predict word at a word, word for word locally. Um, and the VAE also introduced some variability in the generation process, um, hopefully leading to a little bit more novelty because it randomly samples in the latent space. And mine was conditional in particular because I wanted to provide some non-textual con uh, non context. Um, in particular, I wanted to use genre information and Spotify has this cool uh, API that gives you these really specific genres, uh, like Vapor Soul, Indie Optimism, very hipster. Um, but it was pretty good at like pinpointing exactly what kind of music was going on. Um, so in, in addition to the knowledge of general past music writing, um, it could also use a little bit of knowledge that wasn't maybe uh, in the text. And then once I had the VAE, um, I refined it with uh, something called a latent constraint scan, generative adversarial network, 
or LCGAN we were calling it. Um, it helps control aspects of the text uh, that's generated um, by kind of letting you choose what uh, qualifies as a satisfying sample. Um, because, so on, this, on the right here, this blue circle, um, it represents the prior, which is the entire latent space learned by the VAE. Uh, most VAEs won't completely learn to use that entire latent space, and so the green blobby area is where like the most um, realistic uh, samples kind of lie. And then the red blob is where you decide, oh yeah, these are the kinds of samples that I like out of the data set. Um, and so when you apply the LCGAN, it translates the stuff from the realistic part of the space into that more red part of the space that's, you know, for, for my particular case, I wanted more flowery, descriptive language instead of like stuff about maybe the artist or that kind of thing that might be in this, this kind of data set. Um, so what's nice about this is that there was no reach, retraining of the VAE required. It was more of a fine tuning process. And yeah, so, and the other thing is that you need something that can, um, you need something, so you need to be able to pick out what's flowery and what's not basically. And you could do that by hand, but I decided to use uh, topic modeling to do that because my hypothesis was that with topic modeling I could distill the commentary into different types. Um, and as you can see, I've made uh, four different topic groups. There, it ranges from topic one, which has stuff that says like beginning with driving drums and uh, bass paired with songbird vocal harmonies. That's the kind of feel I was trying to get out of my generations versus like a uh, topic model three up here, which is just like tour dates and stuff. Um, I did keep and I did keep some of this stuff in the data set, even though uh, it's not exactly what I wanted to generate, just because it helps to have data that the uh, model can just generally get a feel for English. So you don't want to like limit the data set too much um, and just pinpoint the stuff that you want necessarily. So just real quick, I, this was about the, the Twitter bot deployment pipeline that I had. So it'll go from like a tweet about pumped up kicks, for example, send it to Spotify, get some genre information from it, feed it into the GAN, and then come up with something that's like kind of related. It's really catchy, but the kind that hooks and hooks. Sounds like pumped up kicks to me. Uh, and yeah, this was the most like tweet so far. It's like deployed at the PyBot. Um, <laughs> But I will say that there were a lot of uh, meta generations, like it's like uh, that to the, my feature. So basically I had to like feed this stuff into a spreadsheet and then the human curator, which is me, gets to pick the best ones to send to the Twitter uh, feed. Um, looking forward, it would be cool if I could take these kinds of likes and feed it back into the model and say, people tend to like this kind of thing, so I'm gonna give it more of this. Um, also called human preferences. Um, Spotify also has this cool API called audio features that measures aspects of a song like uh, danceability, energy levels, tempo, valence. That would be cool instead of genre, perhaps. And in general, in my future, I'd like to do more creative coding and more stuff with language and NLP. So I'd like to thank my mentor, uh, Natasha Jock. She's in London right now, so shout out to London. And <laughs> Uh, the other OpenAI scholars and OpenAI in general, thank you for supporting this program. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, she asked if I had considered feeding in the likes or retweets as some sort of reward in reinforcement learning. Yeah, my mentor is super into reinforcement learning. I didn't quite get that far this summer, um, but it would be a cool reward signal for sure, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Right. I think so because um, 
Yeah, because you're uh, sampling from late, this latent space, you can give it any kind of uh, random latent vector. And like I was showing in that little blob, like there's a lot of space where it's just going to be garbled. So, but that's the space that you're working with. And so the, the GAN was supposed to kind of help with that in that I could then tell it, OK, but these are the kinds of thought vectors that are still realistic and still understandable, but also creative and like novel. So yeah, it's definitely a limitation of the VAE. But, and that's why I kind of put the GAN on top to try to help account for that. Oh yeah, I meant to me mention that like GANs on text are hard in general, and I've made it seem like maybe it's a thing that people do, but not quite. Um, it turns out that like text isn't dif differentiable um, when you do back propagation or whatever. So, like, but the the thing that I could do was uh, differentiate through the thought vector, and that works still. So, <laughs> thank you.